Hi everyone. Once had a low and it was a gas. Soon turned out, had a harder glass. Whee! There, classic from the great Debbie, Harry and Blondie there, heart of glass. Now, we know that the heart is not made of glass. It's a very, very important organ in our body. Of course, without the heart, we can do nothing, of course. Now, this video, ladies and gentlemen, is about a man called William Harvey. Born in 1578, died in 1657. Another man in the Renaissance. Now, why is William Harvey so famous in medicine? Well, it's easy to remember. Harvey, ha, heart, ha, ha, ha. If you think of that, Harvey, heart, you'll all remember why he's so famous. Now, what did he do? And what did it lead to? That's what this video hopefully will explain to you. Here's a quote from Harvey. Now, let's see what he actually said, if I can find it. Ah, where's it gone? Mm. He said, sorry about that. Harvey said this, I prefer to learn and teach anatomy, not from books, but from dissection. Now, where do you think he got that sort of idea from? I prefer to learn and teach about anatomy, not from books, but from dissection. That's right. Hopefully you said Andreas Vesalius. That's correct. So, Harvey, like Vesalius in the Renaissance, is interested in human dissection, actually doing the work himself rather than just relying on the old books, like Galen, for example. Can you see a pattern beginning to emerge here in the Renaissance, ladies and gentlemen? I hope you can. So, Harvey, trained in Cambridge, then he went to Padua University, the same university that Vesalius had been at. Now, he was taught by a man called Fabricius, but Fabricius also did experiments on the human body he was trying to do work on the veins, trying to find out what the veins actually did inside our body. And once he's trained, Harvey returns to England. He becomes a top doctor. He's a doctor at the court of King James I and then King Charles I. Now, he's been well trained. He's in the Renaissance. He's trying to ask questions. He's trying to find things out for himself. He's also trying to show that some of Galen's ideas were not correct. Again, a pattern emerging here. Harvey's working with blood and the heart. Now, one of Galen's old ideas was this. Galen said, new blood is made all the time in the liver. The veins carry the blood and air to the rest of the body and then it gets used up so that the liver then has to make new blood. That was Galen's idea. It was wrong. Harvey tried to do experiments to prove that Galen's idea was wrong. Now, why would he think it's wrong? Well, Harvey's a clever man. He's been trained. He's good at maths. He works out. He says, hang on a minute, if the body is producing blood all the time, okay, he works out that in one hour there'd be enough blood produced in the arteries in one hour to be three times the weight of a normal person. Well, he knows that that cannot happen. So now he's got to try and do an experiment to show that he is right and Galen was wrong. Well, he did do human dissection. He did understand the body, anatomy, just like Vesalius. But he takes it a stage further. He does two more different types of experiments. The first he does on frogs. Ribbit, 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 ribbit. Hello! Now, why would he dissect frogs? 
Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, he dissects frogs whilst they are still alive. Oh, no, that's not very good. Why would he do that? Well, first of all, frogs are cold-blooded animals. So therefore, their heart rate is far lower than, for example, us. So by dissecting a cold-blooded animal like that, Harvey's able to see the beat of the heart far more precisely, far more clearly. Harvey's beginning to get the idea that the heart is a pump, and it is pumping the same blood around our body. We know that now, but this idea was challenging Galen. This idea was new. This idea was a change. So his work with frogs begins his new idea. He then does a very simple experiment to us, but very good at the time. He gets the human arm and he ties like a string around it here, very, very tightly. We call that today a tourniquet. And it's used in medicine today to, to stop the flow of blood if you have an injury or a cut so you don't bleed to death. And when he'd done that, of course, the veins begin to stand out. And then very simply, all he did was he put fingers on the arm and released. And what he saw was that the blood would then flow. He's beginning to work out that the heart is pumping the blood one way around our body. Fabricius, remember, his teacher had done experiments, human dissections. They begin to look inside the veins. And inside the veins, if you imagine it as a tube, there are little sort of bits all the way along. And Harvey begins to work out that that is to allow the blood one way flowing along the vein or the artery, but because it has these sort of little bits sticking out inside the vein, the blood cannot go back that way. So he's proving the heart is working like a pump, and the heart is pumping the blood one way around the body. Not air, blood. Harvey is showing that Galen was wrong. Wow. What do you think he does when he's proved this? Remember, it's the Renaissance, printing press. Of course, he puts it in a book. 1628, Harvey produces his most famous book, On the Motion of the Heart and Blood. That's a short title. That's probably all you'd need in an exam. 1628, he puts out all of his work. Harvey has shown that he's right, the heart is a pump, and Galen was wrong. Now then, what's the impact? What's the importance? What is the significance of Harvey? Well, obviously, he has improved knowledge. He has improved our understanding of how the body works, particularly the most important organ, the heart. That's a great step forward. People at the time could realise what was going on in the heart. Well done, Harvey. Big tick. Everyone's happy. What about other doctors? Any ideas? Well, of course. In the long term, many, many, many years further ahead, Harvey's work would improve surgery. How? Well, one of the problems of surgery is blood loss. Therefore, if we know about blood being pumped, maybe we can do something about stopping the blood loss, which would make surgery safer. But of course, that was quite a long way in the future. In the 15 and 1600s, when Harvey was living, all Harvey did was give the knowledge. The impact on surgery didn't happen until far later. Another long-term benefit of Harvey's work, replacing blood, blood transfusions. 
Now, that did not happen successfully until about 1900. Carl Landsteiner, he developed and discovered the different blood groups, O, A, B, and AB. Once that had been discovered, people could look back to Harvey and say, aha, aha, sorry. We now know Harvey plus Landsteiner equals blood transfusions. Another step forward in medicine, but not during Harvey's time. They were long-term developments. Okay. What did Harvey's work and knowledge do to improve cause and cure? Treatment. Did it do much at the time? What do you think? Probably not. He's still not understanding germs causing disease. So yes, he's improving our knowledge of this hugely important organ. But most of his benefit was long term. It happened years, decades, centuries later. OK, so yes, he has made a huge change. But as we'll see, typically, also at the time, there was continuity. What about this? How do you think Harvey felt? Remember, his book was produced in 1628. In his book, he's shown that he's right and Galen is wrong. But at the University of Paris, one of the top universities in France, they carried on teaching Galen's ideas for another 50 years. Not Harvey's. Galen taught at university. How would Harvey feel about that? What do you reckon? I reckon he'd have been heartbroken. Hey! <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Terrible. No, I'm not. I'm not having that. I apologise. So, what factors were involved in the story of Harvey? Have you got some? Renaissance, time of change, communications, printing press, his book, 1628. Technology. He's saying that the heart is a pump. Well, why didn't people before that say that the heart was a pump? Well, quite simply, the pump hadn't been invented. The pump was only invented in the Renaissance. Solomon de Coast was one of the main men who invented the first pump. So once you've invented the pump, then you've got the idea, maybe the heart is like a pump. Technology playing a part. Science, doing experiments, challenging the old traditional ideas of Galen, human dissection, all played a part in the story of William Harvey. So, just before we finish, a couple of things about William Harvey, just points of interest. He was rather a brilliant man, but also quite an odd man. For example, he did post-mortems on dead people. Fair enough, you might say he's a doctor, but he actually carried out post-mortems on his father and his sister. A little bit strange, possibly. Remember I said he was alive in the 1600s? He'd been a top doctor at the King's Court. Well, 1642 to 1649, the English Civil War between King Charles and the supporters of Parliament, the Royalists and the Roundheads. William Harvey actually went to some of the battlefields. And whilst the battle was going on, he's sitting there reading his book. And then, of course, he might examine some of the bodies and improve his knowledge. But he's quite an odd man. But an important one. He changed the way we understood the heart. But most of his benefits came later. So, there we have it. I must admit, you can't beat a good story about the heart. Beat heart. <laughs> Sorry. At any rate, Oh, heart rate. Oh, stop it. Stop it. That's enough. That's enough joke for now. Okay. William Harvey and his frogs. 
hugely important in our knowledge of the body. Hope it's been useful. What's coming next? Do you remember the Black Death? Of course you do. It's one of my earlier videos. Well, that was 1348, 1349. I wonder if the plague is going to return. See you soon. All the best now. Cheers.